uh, you know, good morning, good afternoon, welcome everyone, depending on where you're dialing in from. Uh, welcome to this uh, panel discussion on uh, basically maintaining cold chain storage for vaccines. Um, we're here for, I think, for approximately an hour and we'll have some of your questions to, to take on. Uh, I'm joined by two experts uh, on this particular topic. Um, and, you know, there's a lot to cover here. It's a really big topic, as you all know. Uh, and, you know, any questions that we can't get to, we'll try and collate and answer offline. And please feel free to connect with, uh, you know, these two experts, Thomas and Hans Peter. And so without further ado, I'll just hand over um, to these guys to introduce themselves, where they're from, what they do. It'd be great to hear a bit of a short summarized bio from each of you. And we'll go into the discussion. That would be fine. So, Thomas, if I can start with you, that would be great. Uh, please do go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Nelson. So, my name is uh, Thomas Sorensen. I have worked with uh, UNICEF for, for more than 20 years. I started out in uh, India in health programming. Subsequently, uh, I moved to UNICEF Supply Division in Copenhagen. Um, prior to joining UNICEF, I worked with the uh, vaccine industry. Uh, and this combination between uh, commercial insight from the vaccine industry with the problematic uh, input from, uh, from India uh, gave me a very good and solid platform for considering um, uh, the supply challenges uh, that we have. I mean, to see both the audience uh, in terms of the customer uh, as well as the provider as well and, and could see uh, I mean, the several flips of, of the coins uh, if, if, you, if you may. Um, I spent uh, four, five, six years in the, in the vaccines with focus on the polio eradication and new vaccine introduction. Subsequently, I went to uh, system strengthening, supply system strengthening. That's a whole dedicated function within uh, the supply uh, division where we have some very tight interfaces with our program uh, function as, as well. I have the pleasure of being uh, the regional supply advisor in uh, East and Southern Africa for four years. Uh, spent uh, some good time in Nairobi and the surrounding 22 countries uh, supporting that from the UNICEF's uh, supply operation, including with focus on, uh, on, on vaccines. Then, uh, in the last three, four years, I've been back here in Copenhagen, leading the uh, cold chain team in, uh, in, uh, in supply division, rolling out what is called the cold chain equipment optimization platform program, which um, essentially uh, is about uh, ensuring installation of approximately 100,000 fridges throughout the world both from a procurement and an installation point of view. So massive logistics exercise uh, in tight collaboration with partners. Um, in recent months, uh, last 12 months or so, uh, like everybody else, we have been also over, sort of overtaken by the whole COVID response uh, and, and much of the COVID, the whole CCOP rollout as well as the COVAX response that we have had will be topics that we will be getting back to during the conversation here today, which I look very much forward to. Thank you. For, for sure. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for that. And Hans, Peter, yes, if you'd like to go ahead too, that'd be fantastic. Of course I do. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Elson. So my name is Anthony okay. Lopez. I'm with the UPS Foundation since five and a half years right now. Before, I worked for the corporation UPS in different functions for about 30 years. Um, I have worked in uh, operations, in public affairs, in labor, on projects, uh, on M&A, um, on a number of different countries where we wanted to invest in, uh, and then um, in addition to that, a, a project uh, before I joined the foundation on customs, um, easement of customs procedures especially, which is always a tricky thing. And so that accompanied me into my role <laughs> when, I, when I started working for the foundation. Um, so I'm mainly dealing with uh, two different sides of the international business of the foundation, um, building the pitch to the UN organization that we are partnering with, and on the other side, um, I'm working as well on programmatic work with those UN organizations and with some bigger NGOs. So the one thing I'm doing is uh, building humanitarian supply chains for um, of our income services that we are offering to some partners 
in addition to that, programs that are related to capacity building. Um, and the focus so that has been going on since more than 10, more than nine, 10 years or so, before my time, I started working with the foundation. And the, uh, the capacity building programs, more and more, were focusing on, uh, on um, resilience efforts, so to make sure that um, organizations are prepared and can catch up to the speed of business to a certain extent, uh, making as well uh, the advantage out of some of the experiences that uh, were made in the industry, especially as costs are playing a bigger role. Now, for, for the last one, yeah, one and a half years in the meantime, right now, of course, uh, COVID played a major role in our efforts. And so therefore, um, I was um, unfortunately set back from the residents and offices with a lot of relief work. Um, last year with, uh, uh, with PPEs in the beginning, and then we started working on uh, on delivering vaccines as well, uh, working with the suppliers on hand very closely. Um, and uh, we, we were focusing especially on ultra cold chains um, with our relationship with Pfizer and, and, and others. And um, since yeah, this year, I'm getting an expert in oxygenators. <laughs> Seems like, uh, especially after the after the the Indian. Um, mutation of the virus is uh, spreading out not only in India but uh, most likely as well to neighboring countries, um, as we hear. And so, oxygen is more or less the thing that we are really working on currently. Um, <clears throat> and at least I'm I'm doing that uh, on a daily basis since since a few weeks. So um, I'm not a an expert. I'm an expert in cold chain. Uh, in the sense that I have worked for years coaching and so forth, but more or less um, the foundation team that was working on um, on uh, supporting partners um, had a very deep dive into healthcare and strengthening healthcare systems as well two years ago, because uh, UPS has a very strong footprint in healthcare and healthcare distribution, uh, offering more or less the entire vaccine supply chain and and, and then of course all related um, all related services. And that means as well that uh, we had the opportunity to, uh, you know, work with the experts out of the company um, to offer solutions in, in a lot of cases. Um, and then, of course, running pilots as well, especially when, when innovations were, were, were asked and demanded. So that, in a nutshell, is probably what, I'm, what I can bring to the table. And I hope that we have a lively discussion. Thanks. For sure. Thank you, Hans Peter. And I also forgot to introduce myself. I'm Elsa Satanta, your moderator for today. And I have a background uh, in technology research uh, as well. I advertise uh, basically uh, advising companies on how to adopt technology for better efficiency. Uh, and yes, without further ado, let's kick off with the uh, first question. So, first question we can really look at, I think, is where we are now. Um, and pretty much uh, if I can go to you, Thomas, to answer this question, uh, particularly to shed some light on where, you know, on UNICEF's kind of activity in this space and delivering vaccines, you know, through the cold chain system and through an effective vaccine management kind of perspective. That would be fantastic to hear. If you can give us an update to set us off, that would be great. So I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thank, thanks for that. And, and it, is, it is a big question to kick off, off with. Uh, Everything is, is relative. Let me start start out saying that with, with a, a general dis disclaimer. But I would say that compared to, let's say, 10 years ago, we are much better off globally. Uh, these are the countries that, that UNICEF is normally operating was with than, than, than we were um, 10, 10 years ago. At that point in time, there was actually a call by, by WHO and UNICEF uh, with a significant concern when it came to uh, the, the status of the immunization supply chain. Um, and uh, the call uh, was related to some of the MTGs at the time, uh, so uh, Millennium Development Goals, uh, particularly related to health, where much of it also should be driven by some of the immunization campaigns uh, that was envisioned um, uh, because immunization vaccinations are some of the core drivers for bringing down uh, child mortality and general mortality and, and mo 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 morbidity. But what was seen was that if we, at the global scale, were supposed to get all these new vaccine introduced in the system, we were looking at a system that was not very strong. Um, so unless that, that those box in the system 
were solved, uh, there would be a significant risk that the global community would not reach these ambitious MTG uh, goals. What was set up at the time was the so-called EVM, uh, and it was actually a methodology that has been developed uh, since, I mean, like 15, 20 years, and has been been been, been constant, constantly refined. Um, and the methodology is looking at the supply chain, uh, demonization supply chain, against a number of different parameters. So when we talk about when we talk about cold chain as such and the cold chain logistics, that is sort of one dimension of a multi multi facets um, 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 dimensions that that, that we, are, we are looking at here. Um, after that call, you can say for 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 concern and for for focus, uh, there has actually been substantial focus in the global community around this. So when we look into the last five, six, seven years, a lot of investment has been conducted uh, in in this regard, and. Um, Part of it is sparked by that call for attention. Uh, the other one was the, the parallel introduction of, uh, of quite expensive vaccines as well. So we had no more vaccines, uh, we had rotor vaccines uh, on top of the other routine vaccines that was uh, already in the system here. Um, and clearly when you are introducing expensive vaccines in order to obtain these um, critical health goals, you also need to make sure that you are not dropping the investment. So uh, you might save a penny on the coaching, but I mean you lose a dollar on the vaccine wastage if you are not careful. And, and I think that 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 outcry was uh, was uh, listened to uh, high, high and loudly. What was uh, seen, and then I'm just maybe just scrolling in on the uh, the specific CCOP program that I was talking about before. So that's the coaching equipment optimization platform under Gavi was an investment for around half a, a billion US dollars over uh, four years with introduction of uh, updated coaching equipment um, where you alongside that were also addressing some of the other dimensions on the EVM uh, uh, dimensions that I was talking about before. Um, it will probably be taking too much to Drive in, dive into the specifics on, on on where has the progress been made. But as your starting point, where are we as compared to maybe where we were ten years ago? I would say these investments that have been made recently has brought brought us to a more comfortable place. You can say, and it has also been extremely timely that these investments were, were made some three, four or five years ago and rolled out uh, as as more or less as we speak. Um, because without that, when COVID and uh, subsequently all the vaccine distribution requirements were hitting, uh, if we hadn't done this investment at that time, we would have been uh, in, into to, to a more, much more troublesome situation than we actually are today. Let me just stop there, and Hans, you might also have perspective from the... From the yeah, sure, Hans-Peter, if you'd like to go ahead and, and contribute to Thomas's views, that would be great. I mean... Um this is this is all good, and I think I think that um, you know uh, that the pa that in the past years the um, the uh, the cold the cold chain and systems in countries um, through the investment Thomas was was mentioning. Um, the point here is that that COVID is really a, a very uh, complicated thing, given the fact that um, that the, the demand for uh, for the vaccination is a little bit uh, unclear currently. So we saw, for instance, that. Um, that some countries uh, did not want to have uh, one of the one of the vaccination products, right? So, so, and then they refused, and then they tried to cancel the order, and so forth and so forth. So, uh, then the question is, what is the alternative? Because a lot were in the registration and, and approval process. Uh, so, there's more coming up. I saw a list <clears throat> just recently that there are probably something like 20 products somewhere in the pipeline. Not sure what at the end of the day will be re realized. And of course, the real question is is then, um, well, let's say there are a couple of layers in there. So one layer is um, for how long are we going to do vaccination in certain temperature areas, right? So if we are, if if we have to go for let's say deep freeze, deep freezing, deep frozen products uh, like like Pfizer, um, then you have to build ultra cold chain, and that is very expensive, and that means as well that. Uh, that probably we have to move to more agile supply chains rather than building infrastructures that are uh, that cannot be filled, right? So the cost would be would be very high. Um, I mean, I have the hope that we will have 
multiple products that are running in parallel. Um, uh, so so I, I believe this will come uh, um, within the next weeks and months. And so therefore, the, uh, the two to eight degrees uh, cold chain environment, the question is, how good, is this, how good are the current systems that are built? Um, we have done a pilot in Uganda um, that started in 2018 for about 18 months. And um, working together with Gavi, with the Ministry of Health, we tried to build a, let's say, a sustainable supply chain uh, with uh, three different, uh, four different vaccination products. So it wasn't COVID, but uh, some measles and some others. So uh, we have done that in the traditional way, first of all. I don't want to talk about innovation, it's just very traditional in the way as we are usually building supply chains. So, uh, so we did. Um, uh, we did an assessment, uh, we, we tried to model the entire case, and then we went in and we figured out that, um, that the easiest way would be to add to standard delivery methods into little trucks. So uh, we have dealt with, uh, with little trucks in, uh, in a number of districts, um, those, those, type of, those type, of, type of vaccination um, to the uh, to, to smaller entities that were then uh, responsible for the vaccination process. Now, the good thing here is that we had independent uh, testing of the results. And the fact of the matter is that there were improvements that were incredibly high between 50 and 96% of different factors, like uh, whether the refrigerators were functional. So there was an improvement of 94% when we went into that and checked whether the the, 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 frid the fridges were monthly vaccine orders. And then uh, at the end of the day as well, uploading, uploading daily stock levels. So a lot was going uh, with information. And so um, the question was then, so how, uh, uh, let's say, how resilient are the chains, the supply chains that, are, that have been built up? So there's one thing to bring in fridges, for instance, to have a cold store type of a network. The other thing is how do you maintain it and how are the supply chains built that are around? And therefore, I will stop here then as well. Um, moving to agile supply chain, adapting it to the needs, trying to find out modeling. That's, that's, that's my, my uh, definitely something I, I would bring to the table. Thank you, Hans-Peter. Thomas, I, I see you nodding there as well in agreement. Do you have some thoughts to add as well? The, the, the point or the case uh, from Uganda is a very good illustration on the EVM um, um, uh, methodology I was referring to before, uh, where we do we have data system for, for actually monitoring and acting upon uh, the temperature deviations that we see, the distribution uh, among the different uh, coaching um, uh, stoppage points throughout. Uh, the whole element of HR resources, the linkages to the healthcare workers that eventually are doing uh, the, the immunization session, um, the whole training elements associated with this. So there's a lot of interactivity in, in the system. So it's extremely important that we are not looking at this um, as a one-dimensional thing about a fridge or about, I mean, a totally focus uh, on, on the on the on the cold chain as such uh, however you can say that the the, the title of, of this session is is cold chain so so we have to sort of also maybe uh, from a topical uh, dimension just try to keep with, with within that uh, scope in the covid context the vaccines that are being released there are a few of them that require also cold chain yeah i fully agree i mean that uh, thomas described it well i mean it's indeed the case, let's say, especially if we if we really get these uh, uh, fifteen additional vaccination uh, from 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 other producers uh, from China and other countries on one hand on the market, uh, and usually uh, requirement will be low, it, depending a bit on the country and what the country is able to afford. Uh, costs are different. That's one thing. Not only for the coach, not only for the coach chain or ultra coach chain, but as well for the for the vaccination products. Well. So, you know, move to agile supply chain. Let me just address a few things, what I'm thinking, what is necessary for that. <clears throat> with, the, with the experience that we had from, uh, from Uganda, and then, uh, no, we have, we have run, as, uh, we, we worked on drone pilots, for instance, in Rwanda and in Ghana, and 
Uh, I don't want to go too deep into that, but uh, at least it should be considered that maybe innovative, uh, let's say, modes of transportation can can be a solution for some rural areas as well. Now, uh, we'll probably go into innovation a little bit later in that regard. I know that UNICEF has some experience on drones as well in a couple of countries. We have some as well in our world, so that might be that might be a topic to talk about. But for the cold chain storage for vaccine, I mean. Um, there, is a, there, there needs to be a lot of emphasis, of course, on the infrastructure that has been started. Uh, there is a big question how, how the infrastructure should be set up. Every country is a bit different, so there is no one size fits all. But uh, in most of the countries, you have a type of a hub and spoke system, uh, as we would call it in, in our world, in the logistics world, with, uh, with uh, let's say, main hospitals or main distribution points as well, and then some sub points where, uh, where either um, a smaller a very short distribution chain to the end point uh, then will be conducted or where even vaccinations are given so that people are coming to the end point. So we have already last year, um, some type, I think in October or so I was in a panel, uh, we talked about that and I, and, I, uh, and I complained about the fact that there is not enough scenario planning um, and that, that has been done. What needs to be done is the first thing to be as well modeled and very, very clear, the supply chains, how does it come into the country? What's happening then? Uh, where is it going down the ladder uh, to the to the consumer, to the final to the final uh, consignee? Uh, the IT infrastructure needs to be built as well. So there needs to be a, an IT infrastructure that is uh, a little bit more sophisticated. There are simple models available, and they are okay. It's not not a big deal. So we do not need to have high speed computers everywhere and scanners and whatsoever. It can be done easily with applications. We have proven that in in Uganda, for instance. Um, but there needs to be an, 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 an IT infrastructure that is as well connected to uh, warehouse management systems, to order systems, so that uh, there, is a, uh, there is a comprehensive uh, IT infrastructure uh, built around cold chain. Cold chain isolated uh, does not really work. That's what I'm thinking. Thanks, Hans Peter. Uh, very, very insightful. Thomas, would you like to to contribute to that on those topics that uh, Hans Peter was talking about with scenario planning and so forth, and having certain things in place in infrastructure? Well, uh, Hans Peter is very good at throwing a lot of things on the table. <laughs> so, uh, it, and it, it and it, did, it makes a lot of sense. And and I think and I think there, there was. I mean, you, you've used the word a couple of times. The, the whole area of resilience, and I think that's that's an ex, extremely important um, um, perspective to have on, on this. And it is the, the philosophy that, that that we have been operating with from a UNICEF perspective, uh, supporting governments uh, to make sure that that the systems are in place and how do we strengthen the system. And it, it goes back to that initial. Uh, Prompting point, Elson, you were you were making on the EVM, the effective vaccine management. So, which are the dim dimensions that we are measuring um, the, the health of the of the supply chain on, uh, and how can we strengthen those components uh, in in that system that is being measured to be relatively weak? Um, and I do uh, and we agree with you that. Uh, Oh, I mean, it'd be quite, it, it can become quite documented and well documented when you use a common methodology, EVM methodology, you can see which are the dimensions uh, that are weak um, and compare that across countries. So which countries are particularly weak in which area? So for instance, when we talk LMIS, data management, how well do you react? How well are you acting? And it is an area where um, where we have been, been, been investing Previously, so I think, and and I think it has been also been documented with the way that the initial wave of of, of COVID vaccine has been received. That the countries are actually through that resilience that are already built into the system have been able to cope with them and and, and distribute them uh, relatively um, uh, eff effectively because you have a, a relatively solid foundation uh, to, to to stand on. Um, so yeah. So let me just stop, stop, stop on, on with that point. Over. Sure, sure, and um, thank you, Thomas. And, and just to add on to that, I mean, there's a particular uh, uh, subtopic, I guess, we can go into just really here, um, particularly for you know, there's markets with very um, isolated and rural communities. I mean, the last mile is a very critical. <clears throat> Uh, you know, um, kind of subject to, to deliver, really. Um, and I know, Thomas, that, you know, with UNICEF, you've been working with the WHO and a PQS team. Um, can you tell us more about your activity in that area? Because, you know, everything can go right until that particular, 
you know, period with the last mile. How is that being tackled and, and addressed? That would be great to hear. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. So I think the the, the last last mile is is of you can say of, of a particular concern, uh, including also because uh, it is very often associated also with the uh, most vulnerable population. So those that are hardest to reach uh, out there. And as part of uh, the UNICEF mandate and our operation, our overall target is that we want to reach those that are hardest to reach, uh, including because. The, the general functioning of the health system, um, if you it, and it's documented, if you're able to to reach those, well, then you have actually a general reach uh, or, or, or increase of your 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 health indicators. So it is. I mean, there is a, a, a logic in, in, in connection between between the two. Um, and specifically, when we are looking at the uh, the last mile here, so the, the, again. Just going back to the CCOP program and where has the initial focus been? So uh, for those, I was talking about 100,000 fridges, and now I'm just looking again from a, 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 an infrastructure point of view. The 100,000 fridges that has been distributed in the first rollout of, of this program has been focusing on, on the health facility level. And typically, the, the health facility level cover a population of four to 5,000 uh, individuals. Uh, so with the definition, we are out in that field. And this is uh, a joint, I mean, uh, priority with Gavi and with WHO. And so it, it is generally recognized that. So the infrastructure to the lowest point uh, is, is there. Then that is supplemented with um, uh, with outreach sessions. So that's part of the Reach Every District strategy that, that UNICEF is, is, is applying and, and is advocating for uh, in, in the field. And that is typically uh, associated with monthly or weekly, weekly um, uh, based on micro-planning outreach to the most uh, vulnerable um, uh, population sites or those that are not having direct access to that health facility level I was talking about before, where the fridge is actually standing. And this is where uh, the next mean of cold chain equipment gets into the equation. And that's typically where you have the cold boxes and where you have the vaccine carriers coming in, um, which are also areas of, uh, of uh, innovation, you can say, uh, to, uh, how do we avoid that the vaccines uh, is getting overcooled or is not sufficiently cooled? How do you make sure that the health worker that is carrying these are not uh, getting a, a pain in the back by uh, too heavy? I mean, so there is a lot of, of these elements uh, to take into consideration to make sure that um, uh, that, that the logistics is, 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 is operating. In the specific uh, COVID vaccine context, I mean, we have already... In discussing some of the of the, the, the concerns that we have here that I mean what about UCC so I mean getting UCC requiring I mean those that require ultra coaching into that very last mile is, is next to impossible so this is where you need to work with reverse logistics you can say uh, when it's getting spread uh, out uh, uh, in, into that the, the other dimension uh, and, and critical quality on, on the, in the COVID context uh, is the term of stability data of many of these vaccines are still in development because all vaccines are rolled out so you do not have all the data yet so um, similarly the, 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 the short shelf life of many of these vaccines are also ticking very quickly um, so there is a range of, of very specific uh, challenges associated with, with, with the last mile here um, both on the in general, as I was talking about before, and where the innovation is sticking in, but also to address the specific uh, COVID vaccine um, uh, challenge. Sure, sure. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Hans Peter, will you be able to share your views as well? I'm sure the scenario planning Uganda has been big learning curves, particularly particularly with the last mile. So it would be great to hear what you think. Well, I mean, uh, Thomas raised a few points that are really uh, important, and uh, the, the one thing is more products coming in. And that means as well that there are maybe different, let's say, call it standard operation procedures for those vaccines, right? How how are they stored? Uh, you know, maybe maybe uh, uh, some some of them are you know are due earlier than others. So so those type of things need to be need to be taken into consideration, especially if there are choices. So I'm not sure, no idea currently um, how it looks like in a year from now, but. 
what I could imagine is that when, when more vaccine is available, let's say from 20 suppliers, I'm just throwing a, a number into as an example, uh, then, uh, then countries might order from different suppliers, um, as we have it right now with mainly three, two or three suppliers uh, in the European Union, for instance, but um, how is it in some of the countries in the LMIC countries? So they might have 15, 10, let's say 10 different vaccines um, in the system that are um, that are uh, that might have to be treated in different ways. So what we need is uh, education and training as well. So there needs to be standard operation procedures that need to be shared um, with with those that are part of that supply chains. Supply chains in general are we believe that supply chains are easy. They are not easy at all because a lot of people don't have a clue how that works. So we have seen a lot of weird things, to be very honest, in the past years. Um, I'm just giving you one example. There, there was a fridge, and I'm talking about fridge maintenance, very simple things. Uh, it, we saw there was a fridge, and the fridge was not plugged in because the cable was through a wall to, the, to another room, and in that room there were people that wanted to charge their cell phones. So therefore, they plucked out the fridge, put in the cell phones, and once they were done, the fridge was still not plugged in. And now the big thing comes. A nurse who was asked to control the temperature of the fridge was going to the fridge every hour, and she had a note, and she saw that the temperature was falling. And the only thing she did is she simply noted that into a control sheet, closed the door, and then came back one hour later. There, because she wasn't trained to say, if the, if the temperature is falling for two degrees or so, there's something I have to do. For instance, go to the next doctor or whatever, or ask the electrician, whatever. Uh, so just taking that simple example, and that's true, by the way, we have seen that. Uh, it, t just taking this simple example, uh, if we're talking about many, vac many vaccines, expensive vaccines, and processes that are financed with billions and billion, billions of dollars, if they are falling wrong, then we have done a mistake. So therefore, we need to plan ahead and think about standard operation procedures, how to get those guys educated about uh, what a supply chain and a cold chain supply chain is looking like and what needs to be done where and set the tone and set the rules. Otherwise, we probably might run into, into issues in that regard. Um, the, the, the other question, of course, is, uh, and this is, well, a chance, a, a real opportunity, now with COVID and a lot of, let's say, fear uh, that is going around COVID, uh, there's potentially a good chance as well to build the, the bridge to the standard immunization campaigns and make them more, even more relevant. I know that in, in some countries there are some, um, there are some, uh, there's reluctance towards, to, towards standard immunization campaigns in some cases in the population. So we might be able to even achieve more, uh, let's say, with, uh, with, uh, with COVID as the alarm bell, right? Uh, and make sure that we are even able, able to stabilize uh, this type of uh, cold chain environment that vaccines usually need uh, in a better manner in the course of the next one, one to two years. Thank you. Great, thank you, Hans-Peter. Hans, do you have anything to, to add to that before we move on to another question? I think it's uh, well covered there, so uh, please move on. Okay, sure, sure. Well, let's move on to perhaps something uh, like you know, different markets and how some countries may lack cold chain storage capabilities. I mean, we heard your example there, Hans Peter, really. Uh, so, you know, they lack kind of uh, cold chain storage capabilities for vaccines and the difficulties that these, you know, uh, propose. Um, Thomas, you had said in some answers, really, that, um, you know, the, the, the way, um, you know, you're approaching it is that identifying the gaps, really, and, you know, through inventory systems and gap filling measures. Um, can you tell us more about you know, this particular approach, that would be great. Yeah, yeah well, I, I, I think that, that refer maybe back to, to the, the EV, EVM again. Uh, so, so which dimensions are you assessing uh, the, the, the cold chain uh, uh, against? Um, and I think uh, it's, and I think actually, no, actually taking that, because the, the, also the EVM is, is, is trying to, to have some standard operation or have some implicit standard operation procedures uh, as the backbone when, when that uh, methodology is developed, uh, actually going a little along the lines that, that Hans-Peter was referring to before. Um, so 
how the connection between, I mean, your maintenance strategy, your training strategy of the health workers, uh, how to uh, read a temperature moni uh, monitor that is is, is activated, uh, how to use the standardized equipment that is is, is coming in. So it, it's a relatively complex system when you start to look at it, um, and and also the training component associated uh, with it. Um, and I I mean I fully hear hands, and I think here some 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 very important points uh, about um, constantly ensuring the inter in, interconnected interconnectivity between the different components that they are actually working. So when the health worker does see a deviation, that you know what to do, right? Um, and and I think will probably also be that you you will see a tendency and system to be relatively conservative as well. So the system being represented by potentially UNICEF from time to time and probably also WHO being even more conservative of making too many changes because if you start to change one component of your system well then the assumption about how it interplays and interface with the other component start to be uh, uh, be challenged that also implies that you might sit here in uh, i don't know where you guys are located in the world i'm sitting here in copenhagen right quite far away from uganda uh, right now uh, and to say well uh, i'm from television and i might have the idea about okay let's introduce a new temperature monitoring recorder because that serves a lot of, of Problem and introduce that, but if that's not part of the standard operations he just already described, then I mean you you run into to, to problems. So you might optimize in some part of your system, but it does have implications in other parts of the system, and those are the general challenges that we are, are facing. Um, or not, it's it's those inter interconnectivities that, that we need to be aware of. Uh, so when we fine tune in one area, we need to be sure that we are not impacting too, too, too greatly in, 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 in others. Let me just Very interesting. Out. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Hans Peter, would you agree about that, uh, about Hans, uh, Thomas's views really? Uh, with one Absolutely. Also, I think they are making the same experience in that regard. And, and Thomas, can, uh, you know, much deeper in the humanitarian system than I am. Uh, probably um, through the work uh, with the country officers and support, we'll, we'll probably even uh, have more details on that. But what I can, can tell you is uh, very simple. I mean, we were working with UNICEF uh, years ago on a, on a on a program that was called um, that was called Viva, right? And uh, Thomas might recall that uh, Viva program uh, called Viva, meaning visibility for vaccines, which is a very simple thing. It was more or less like a program um, that helped. Uh, um, um, uh, vac vaccination officers in in countries in in uh, in different countries, especially uh, in in MIC countries, uh, to let's say have an overview on their on their stocks, and then it offered as well some visibility tools to make sure that uh, that a that a person that was uh, responsible for purchasing or ordering the needs could go to uh, his or her finance minister and tell well see this is the projection for the next weeks and if we continue doing that in that particular way then we will run out of stock in four weeks from now so we need to order now and so simple right simple thing not very complicated okay so that is in the meantime this is a standard application within unicef however um we came to the conclusion that it is probably um, interesting to more digitalize all the different aspects around healthcare supply chains and vaccination, especially vaccination. And so uh, the idea was born for a stock management tool that should include different aspects of stock management, order management, and then some some uh, some um, some functionalities that were provided by Excel tools through the WHO. We wanted to, you know, have a real integrated system that is, let's say, closer to the to the to the to the to the industry um, in the sense that, you know, taking advantage of what has been invented there in the past years. It was not possible that easily because uh, the ideas were to make it very good, but it was too complex for those who could do it. Uh, so training and so forth was a big was a big thing in that regard. So, nutshell version here is: um, the more we are thinking about integrating that into standard immunization campaigns, having complex supply chains, making sure that we have as well uh, control, not controlled IT controlled environment, 
more aspects and layers are coming into that. It is getting complex. And for complexity, in some cases, there are not the people around that are trained for doing it. And so this is the big problem where we can fail in really doing doing good in that regard, especially in LMISD countries. That's what I think is, is relevant in that, in that aspect. <clears throat> Thomas, would you, would you agree as well um, with this increase in complexity and having to manage that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, simplicity is king. I mean, that that really should be be the mantra here. Uh, and and I think the the the, um, the 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 struggle is to to also really to separate between all the good ideas that are coming in because all the good ideas, I mean, is 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 at risk of of just increasing the complexity all the time. And, and I think both at local, but also at some of the global guidelines that can be coming out. So I think really uh, to, to have, have that in mind. I think maybe one of the, the examples um, that, 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 that can probably also be given, and, and I think it's, 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 it's touched upon in, in some of the other um, um, prior discussions that, that we have had here, is, is also some of the private sector in, involvement in, in, in handling this. And sometimes that could potentially be some of the, the, the disruption that, that could, could be happen, happening. And I think maybe just using an example that, that we have uh, in, the, in the, the current system, uh, just looking uh, that has been evolving out of the CCOP and, and the, 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 the um, uh, ambitions of, of thinking more in, from innovative perspective here that uh, as we are introducing new fridges uh, it's also potentially or not potentially it is very often also coming with what is called remote temperature monitoring devices rtmds um, and 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 those rtmds will be able to send a signal from the fridge and say well right now feeling too well my um, the fridge is not feeling too well um, uh, come and fix me right um, and 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 that's that signal that that hans was as peter was referring to before that the health worker might not be reacting on right, uh, as part of the, the temperature deviation some of the innovations uh, more from a contractual point of view that that we have been receiving here from from a supply division point of view is that the the industry is saying well i mean actually we can uh, we 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 obtain that signal as well. So we are sitting in Europe or in China or where the fridge is coming from, and we can see that that fridge that is now in Uganda that Hans Peter was talking about before is not feeling too well. Uh, we can actually have through our local service provider a very quick uh, person coming out fixing that component in the fridge that is not functioning. Uh, and you start to see the industry uh, sort of getting into that area where that's traditionally handled by the public sector and they I mean are offering uh, solutions uh, that potentially could be handled via a private service agreement instead so rather than internalizing it in the government system you can actually outsource it and sort of get rid of the he headache from a public point of view um, by, by by paying the amount and it, it and it's it, it sounds very appealing in in many ways and 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 then it is also tested out there in in and, and tested at scale because some of the manufacturers are using this as part of their their new contractual setup it does come then though with 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 some of the other uh challenges associated with that you, you start to shake the tree i mean so you have your standard operation procedures that how things are working and you might fix it for your immunization supply chain but what about your supply chain for the other commodities that are also dependent on the same services that is built around that public uh, so so you 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 have disruptive innovative ideas coming out of programs which from an isolated perspective can be working and I mean definitely are working, but one of the impacts in the other parts of the system, I think, is ex extremely interesting from a you can say an intellectual point of view and also a practical point of view as we implement for the moment to to observe and to to monitor where is it actually moving and what how does how will it impact also some of the global guidance that 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 we are providing. So this is just an example of of how to. At one hand, have one hand have a simple system that you want to maintain simple, and we simplify it even further. But if we simplify it by using another sector, what are the other implications that 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 would have in other parts of our system? 
I hope this makes friends with the same. Oh, very much so. Very much so, Thomas. Very interesting. Very, very much so. Um, Hans Peter, would you have anything to add on to that, you know, with other external involvement, in a, you know, as part of the solution? That would be great to hear. Oh, that's a uh, that, that that's definitely right in the middle of the right in the middle of the of, of of what we need to do. So using technical innovation that is available, especially it is getting cheaper, right? So if I'm thinking about the fridges, I mean, in two years from now, you probably don't don't get any fridges on the, any fridge on the market that is not speaking to you, right? So that means there's a certain portion of intelligence built in any waste, and that means that this intelligence then will be in a 300 euro fridge for for the Western world and for for maybe some of the some of the countries where where fridges are are, are standard in every kitchen. Now um, now that means as well we can use that one and then uh, connect with connect with uh, let's say supervision supervisory systems as well. Good idea, great, and I'm sure that this is something that will come more and more. Um, we have to make sure that we are that with the health workers at the end that they don't feel remote controlled in each and every thing they are doing. So there's a little little red light blinking somewhere, and then uh, two minutes later there's a phone call coming from a from a from a central unit saying, "Hey, you have to do now A, B, C, D, E." Right? So you, you potentially look feel a bit strange and strange in that regard. So we have to make sure that people understand that it is for their health. But in any event, best practices to use. Um, uh, is always good to look into what is going on in neighboring markets, for instance. I mean, I was talking to an Indian group yesterday. Um, they wanted to know and talk about how can they build a uh, sustainable supply chain uh, and uh, order management and so forth for oxygen, right? So that's the top thing. And I mean, uh, you know, I'm not an expert in building oxygen supply chain, but there are a couple of things that we know which can work, for instance, in uh, some of the projects we were doing, we were working with gas bottles as well, right? So we figured out that a lot of fridges were driven by gas, not by electricity. So that means that um, that gas bottles were needed somewhere. And so um, gas bottles then were part of an existing supply chain. So when people went out um, for delivering stuff, <clears throat> they, they had gas bottles in their uh, delivery trucks as well and brought them to the sites. And now, if you if you think further down the line, then you say uh, the the more you are able to use existing infrastructure, the better it is, because at the end of the day, it's about uh, utilization of infra infrastructure, which is driving costs down, right? So the less the, le the less you have fixed investments, or so to the extent necessary, you only have fixed investments. Then then you probably uh, are agile in the sense that you can build sustainable supply chains and then will work as well through different modes of transportation so open using infrastructure and be open fantastic thank you hans peter i think we'll 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 leave it there very good points for the audience to take away so i think that brings us to the end i would have liked you guys to sum up more but i think we've run out of time i think we've, we've gone through a lot of detail there so thank you very much both thomas and hans peter for uh, for joining and i think you know any questions that will come through we'll collate and get back to you offline so Thank you very much. And hopefully we can have this talk again this time next year and see how things have progressed. But thank you for a very insightful, interesting discussion to you both and to the audience for joining. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you for leading it. Take care. Take care, Hans Peter. Thanks.